want to impose the worst case scenario is them feeling like people have actually forgiven. That is that the other side wants to move on, that they want to improve conditions and that they have recognized what is necessary to be outdone. I think absent that, even if you believe in redeemability, you won't necessarily believe that the other side has agreed to redeem themselves. They've recognized what they've done, which is a precondition to you accessing the benefits of a norm of redeemability. That is, you think the other side wants to atone for their sins. That's much less likely under their side, because notice the framing they want to talk about. You are increasingly likely to get politicians to advertise the fact that the things that I have done don't necessarily cast that badly on who I am as a person. I must be redeemable, which means that things I did must have explanations beyond the fact that I'm a shitty person. Offering these kind of explanations makes it feel like the people that perpetrated crimes under both sides don't really acknowledge how bad the things they are and don't want to take blame for it on themselves. I think in virtue of the fact that you normalize this kind of rhetoric under their side's house, you probably make it harder for victims to feel like things are okay and therefore for sides to begin repairing under their side of the house. I think forgiveness is a precondition to this problem because you need not just to think someone's redeemable, but they want to be redeemed, but they don't want to do the same thing and they recognize what they're wrong. Secondly, in terms of the fact that the Catholic Church can maybe, I guess you can mitigate discrimination that would otherwise exist because you can preach that everyone is redeemable. I want to note that you had a large number of religions that preached that everyone is redeemable. That is, it's possible people outside the religion to still get to heaven, but nonetheless treated those people shittily. So I think it is one pre thing to prove that this narrative exists in the sense that it's propagated, but quite another fact to prove that it actually changes the way that people behave, which is not a burden I think they take on under their side of the house. The second thing I want to note uh, is yeah, even if we have some more exclusive forms of morality under our side, I think it's possible absent or with a normal redeemability for bad moral practices to exist under their side. That is, you can say, we'll treat you like shit, but you can be redeemed in heaven. So I'm not clear necessarily they achieve the benefits or that we can't achieve them under our side. Firstly, talking about better interpersonal relationships. The premise of this argument is people are way too forgiving, right? I think redeemability does not just concern whether or not you believe it is possible for someone in their long run to have been a good human being in their life or to become a good human being in their life. It's also a question of whether or not in your own relationship, they be can become the person they need to be. In your life, they can become the person they can be to you, whether you're, you can redeem your relationship with them under their side of the house. People are bad at making this judgment, which has a number of impacts. The first thing is that they just don't necessarily agree or like impose on changing just the relationships which are bad because they don't see them as being that bad in light of the fact that everything is redeemable at some point so the cost of allowing relationships to get that bad is worse but secondly they relate and re remain in relationships with friends who don't reply to their text messages who actively gaslight them who are mean to them and make unpleasant comments about them with partners who make and manipulate them into doing a whole bad things like literally all of the stuff that people continue to be allowed to do i think your intuition is right this isn't just in light of the fact that you think they are redeemable or the relationship is redeemable. It might also be that you don't want to admit you got into a bad relationship. I think that that norm in and of itself is conditioned by virtue of the fact that a norm of redeemability exists under their side of the house. Because I do think that most people recognize there is stuff that is wrong and they shouldn't have to put up with it under their side of the house. But when you think people are redeemable, you are more likely to emphasize that you can't impose costs upon them because they are morally important people and you have an obligation to stay in that relationship. Or you have an obligation to do everything you can to fix the situation before you move on. But thirdly, even if you don't believe that it's just about making people who do recognize things are bad, which I think is the worst cases under our side, but about people who necessarily won't. I think in as much as this narrative changes, you stop seeing TV shows about someone through their love healing the broken man who is a bit toxic, and instead focusing on the actual tangible steps instead, like ending relationships or fixing them, that means you are more likely to focus on the actual steps that mean you ought to get out of these relationships in the first place. I think when you stop focusing on how you can change people and make them better and good parts of your life, you are far less likely to want them to maintain in your life. This means that people are going to make better decisions about relationships and maintain in happier relationships for the vast majority of cases. I want to note, this is the majority of life, right? Like, I think the cases that OOG want to talk about are kind of corner cases, like I know there are a lot of post-conflict societies, but this relates to literally the way that everyone in the world lives. And I think a lot of people make shit decisions. They choose the friends that they're with for awful reasons. We empower them to think instead critically about the extent to which things are good or bad for them, because they are not instead preoccupied with the fact that everyone will one day be okay as a member of their life under their side of the house. Uh, this also is a reason, by the way, that other countervailing norms, like things that say, oh, if men do this thing, then women shouldn't necessarily complain, isn't relevant. Because this argument is not specifically a case about sexist behavior. It's about people being able to make generic judgments about what they consider good behavior, which means that it's not true that there are countervailing norms across the entirety of society with the limit their ability to access this under their side of the house. I'll take closing. So just because you believe someone's redeemable does not mean that they're automatically redeemed. 
presumably they have to do particular actions that show that they're able to change. All you show that it's possible for them to change, not they automatically change. A good example of why you defend what I'm describing is the status quo, where there's a bunch of media about how relationships are solved through love that suggests that's useful. Two, in as much as your narrative is going to be expressed, it's going to be expressed through things that people will learn from, that will also suggest this is something you attempt to try in a majority of circumstances, and this intent to portray it in a normatively good light. How do we deal with transgressions? The first thing to know is that it makes it significantly easier for people to justify staying with friends who have done really terrible things. That is by pointing to the ways that their actions were not that bad because they had other stuff going Going on or by saying look they made a mistake but you know everyone makes mistakes people can get over it these are really bad because one it allows the person not to feel guilty and actually learn from their actions because they believe that they must be good enough that people will stay with them that means you don't get reformed think to the large number of men who persist when their friends don't take appropriate uh, who persist with friends who do shitty things uh, secondly it means that you gaslight people who are victims because they constantly hear about how great this person is though, though that person is supported often through like a legal case if that's kind of thing that is really really bad for a large number of victims secondly i think you get a harsher treatment of prisoners under their side of the house and this is a little bit counterintuitive but here's why i think under uh, our side we're likely to get very black and white judgments that is to say someone is irredeemable is a very very difficult thing to say which is why primarily to say someone's irredeemable gets reserved for a very very high burden of people this means under our side we often argue for lesser senses for people by saying at least they are not this terrible thing which is what makes you irredeemable and therefore in light of not being irredeemable we can argue for less severe prison sentences at the very least this suggests that any claims about how we punish people less from gov need to be met with weighing against this claim i don't think they'll be able to do that and we oppose i think that speaker for those remarks and um or by saying poi out loud i don't respond if it's in the chat The problem with OG is that they have a whole lot of analysis about what the real world looks like, i.e. that priests, that revolutionary leaders have strong incentives, and indeed that people also react very, very strongly to being hurt, i.e. if my grandfather is dragged away, I feel a visceral sense of anger, pain, and trauma. The reason why that's important is they spend far, far more time describing these structural conditions than describing the power of this narrative in the first place, and really the discussion of the narrative in their case just functions as a magical wand that seems to solve all of these problems. This debate is about this that supports the narrative, i.e. it's a discussion about whether or not it causes more good than harm in the status quo. And in the status quo, interacts with lots of other narratives. For example, the narrative that some people go to hell and some people go to heaven suggests that there's a clean black and white line between good and evil, for example, and, what, and that there are some people that can never make up for the harm that they do. But second of all, there are just things such as a death sentence, which means that there are norms which mean that there's an uphill battle they need to fight, and it's not the case that automatically everyone believes in their world. Three things in my speech. First of all, dealing with the main thrust of their case, i.e. post-conflict societies, because everything else is a little bit of a blip. Then I'll talk about interpersonal relationships and do some weighing to explain why it's the most important argument in the round, before finally cleaning up the crumbs of analysis coming from DPM. Okay, post-conflict societies. So their argument goes as such, i.e. bridge. So the, the clash is about whether or not it's easier to bridge gaps between groups that had previously been fighting with or without this narrative that all people are redeemable. The crux of the OG argument runs as follows. If people believe that everyone from the other side is redeemable and, and, and empathizes with them, there are benefits A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Problem with this is that premise one is flawed, i.e. they assert that people believe that everyone on the other side is redeemable. The narrative does not have this power. Why? Because for that belief and to resonate with you, you need to genuinely believe it. The problem though is if you really went through, lived through the Moranian, uh, the Rwandan gen genocide, for example, if you have lived through civil war, if indeed you live in a place where religions are clashing, then you've likely seen loved ones dragged away. And the reason why it's difficult to empathize with the people who drag them away is because there's an asymmetry in the degree to which you know and care about your relatives or your loved ones or your in-group versus people who are from outside groups. The reason why that's impactful is that that means that the people who hurt you end up looking like faceless monsters who you don't see as people at all. The reason why that's important is because that means that when you try to peddle narrative that everyone's redeemable, it's just that, you know, it's fine. This doesn't stick with people who are traumatized, angry, and hurt. Therefore, we prefer a world where people understand that some people maybe are past redemption, and that's okay, but that, that isn't the vast majority of people. 
Why is this a likely world? Because they themselves argue that politicians have a strong incentive to disseminate, to disseminate narratives that are going to accelerate healing. For example, the South African narrative that, look, we need to come together as a rainbow nation and put aside past harms, regardless of whether or not they have or haven't happened, uh, that whether or not the individual monsters should or shouldn't be punished for it. This also looks, I think, just a disseminating narrative that, look, maybe there are some people at the top who are monsters, but the average person is a victim of circumstance just like you and me, or very simply just by saying, yes, yeah, some people are awful, but others are fine, and the most important thing to do is just to benefit yourselves right now. This is much, much better because people are far, far more likely to buy this because that, there is that huge cognitive dissonance and that feeling of clash and resistance and anger when you're being spoon-fed this narrative. Honestly, the same response applies to their arguments of proselytization as well, because they themselves give lots of reasons why proselytization is good and therefore that religions have an incentive to bring people into the fold. Therefore, even if some people, a minority, are irredeemable, you're not likely to say that everyone who was Muslim is irredeemable on the basis of that insofar as it would create religion and they themselves explain why it's undesirable. Okay, interpersonal relationships. This is the most important argument in the round because this is the use case. Why? Two reasons. One, because this is because this is stuff that applies to your friends, your partners, and your family. You spend the most time exposed to them, but more importantly, you're invested enough in them to care about whether or not they're redeemable as people and think, should I or should I not consider them as good people? Greg tells us that, you know, these are the people who are disproportionately affected by this narrative because it plays exactly to their wounds and what they would love to believe in. That's really, really bad because it leads to gaslighting, it leads to disproportionate and unequal abusive relationships, and leads to just huge amounts of pain and everlasting wounds that drag on forever. The responses we get to this are honestly quite poor. The first response we get is that people are more likely to abuse up on your side because now, because they have equal relationships because both parties believe that the other is redeemable. Like, and, and they say that abuse is less of a problem because there's a norm to be good. A few responses. One, men who abuse their partners do not abuse their partners because they feel like they are redeemable. Because if they cared enough about moral compasses to consider redemption and qualities like good and bad, they're probably the people who also realize that hitting your partner is morally disgusting and wrong. There, but two, clearly these norms exist inside the school, but people are still victims of these, of these harms. And the thing is, these victims currently rationalize when they hear this narrative that it's fine, that at the end of the day, he still loves me and it's fine, I can sort this out. And we deeply, deeply regret that. The feeling from OG is that they never reach the worst case scenario. That is, that some people are irredeemable. For example, if my ex-boyfriend has hurt me, nothing he does is able for it to make me forgive him for his actions. And we are really, really important. And then the second response they give us is the idea about escape. I.e. that in the long term, you can do things, when you, when you believe that he's a redeemable person, then you you can just let it go out of your mind, right? Two responses. One, if you believe he's a redeemable person, it's far, far less easy to dismiss because instead of being like, he was not worth spending my time on, I should cut my losses and go. And or it's what you think instead is you reflect back on the nitty gritty of every single interaction you have. And you say, was I at fault here? What could have I done better to resolve things? The thing is that the redeem redeemability is, goes both sides. And closeness means that if someone is redeemable, there's a moral obligation on me as the partner or the close confidant of that person to reach out and do that redemption because otherwise it would be morally wrong for me to let him go and leave him to my own devices. That's incredibly bad because that's one of the key mechanisms which abusers or just bad people use to trap people into toxic and unbalanced relationships. This is the most important argument in the round. Why? One, because I think that their impacts on the prison industrial complex so on and so forth are just really, really implausible because as they themselves say, politicians have incentives, people are driven by profit. There are so many different entrenched factors mean, which mean that regardless of whether or not this narrative existed or not, that they probably still have Happen. On the other hand, when people believe that people are irredeemable, when people believe that everyone is redeemable, that's the point at which you genuinely change the way in which you evaluate your own responsibilities and think it's not my responsibility to rehabilitate this man, and you think that what I should prioritize is myself. But moreover, here's why it's also just the case that that we prove we save huge of people just because I think that we're able to change things because you don't feel guilt and crucially. Everything you feel about what my responsibilities are stem from whether or not the way in which you see the other person. Very proud to oppose. I thank that speaker for those remarks, and I thank all speakers on the top half. I now call upon the government member speaker to continue the case for the side of government. Here, here. Hello. Um, am I audible? Yep, I can hear you. Awesome. Um, 
All right, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. So I agree with XK. OG tries to win the debate on context, i.e. they say, very terrible situation. We have this magic wand of reconciliation, therefore we get massive benefit without really explaining and dealing with the engagement that is necessary for opening opposition as to how do we deem whether or not people are irredeemable and whether or not that is a smart calculus we can make. And that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. So I first want to note, a lot of the examples that come out at LO are simply a list of bad things. Like, man, if you need people to reply to you on Facebook, I can add you, I swear I'll reply to you. But none of this is analytically rigorous, right? None of this is proof that people are terrible and often incredibly forgiving of other individuals. What I'm going to tell you now is that how we deem how irredeemable people are, because note that the like, you know, operative word in the motion is all, is incredibly irrational, and therefore the default of assuming that all people are redeemable is the best thing to do in this debate, and I'll explain why. So how do we deem that people are irredeemable? The first thing I want to note is that OG is correct in saying that circumstances play a big part in the flaws that people have, but know that we deem people irredeemable and have character flaws to the repetition and standards of behavior, i.e. if you do terrible things multiple times, that tells us what kind of person you likely are to be. Insofar as these people are bound to circumstance and not their individual individual agency, it's far more likely that the actions they do out of circumstance are attached to their agency as a result. What do I mean? We're talking about repeat convicts that are African American simply because they have historically been taken out of the system that allows them to be able to do much else. But at the same time, guys like Brock Turner are told it was one mistake, he messed up, but we ought free him tell us that when you are free from circumstance and messed up from like multiple times, we ascertain it as a part of who you are due to the repetition of this behavior. And therefore, the people who are victims of circumstance are told they are the most irredeemable. But secondly, it's the control you have over your image, i.e. the people who are most irredeemable are the people who are only seen doing evil actions. And note that these like, uh, especially for weak groups in society that have little power, they have little to no control over the image that they portray upon other people. In fact, a lot of the time, there's massive incentive to demonize them or show that they are criminals, to show that they are bad people, etc. When conversely, the rich and powerful are the people who have the largest capacity to change how people perceive them, i.e., if you're rich and powerful, you can do so many evil things, but you are redeemable because you can massively donate to multiple charities, because you can do PR events, because you can change the way people view you and ensure that that's likely to happen. Happen. Thirdly, the decision-making process of whom we deem to be guilty are also controlled by the rich and powerful, the media, the judiciary, the laws we carve around whether or not we can ascertain guilt and whether or not people are redeemable are created by these individuals. Note that we do not, or rather, they do not know what the experiences of poverty are like and what the degree of agency you have over crime is likely to be. But they do know things like it's so scary to be canceled as a celebrity and therefore far more likely to say that these people are redeemable insofar as they think it's an incredibly unjust system, but things like theft or petty crimes are things that we can no longer forgive. What does this prove? We are unlikely to make smart decisions about whether or not some people are, ought to be forgiven. Why is it better then to assume that all people ought to be forgiven? Know that they do not prove their comparative, i.e. if the rich and powerful, I've shown you the large scale inequality of the application of this, some people are okay, some people are not kind of paradigm. It's then, I would, I, I would argue, the punishment that we're likely to give them is unlikely to be effective in any meaningful change so far as they can often dodge punishment. They'll often still be rich and famous after being canceled, etc. But for the people who receive this punishment on the other end of the spectrum, who I'd note are A, are far more likely to be greater in number, but B, far more likely to be victim of things like the criminal justice system and therefore also unable to get jobs in the future. People are far more likely to be victim of social exclusion to the degree they're always viewed as criminals as opposed to people acting out of circumstance are far more important and therefore ought to be prioritized in this debate. I don't think they're able to deal with whom we deem to be irredeemable as opposed to just saying we can kind of make smart interpersonal relationships. I'd argue the personal bias that we have, the psychological bias that we have, incredibly inform us of who we can deem to be forgiven as a result. I'll take a few from OO. Greg told you very clearly that things such as the desire to reduce crime overall, things such as the fact that rehab has just been proven in many case systems, means that your things of prison reform are symmetric. Our use case is far more relevant because that's where you make assumptions about whether or not you'd put effort into saving someone. 
that is just not true. A lot of people that tough believe that tough on crime policies are incredibly strong deterrents. A lot of people believe that they deserve to be punished because they can no longer be saved. We ought to kill them or keep them in prison forever. So it's just simply not likely that this is the case and is far more likely to be the case on our side. You can't just say it's always symmetric. But secondly, I think there's no like discussion of the counter narrative that's likely to exist on top half. And I'd say if you look at see the, the wording of the POI from closing opposition, at least people do not deserve our forgiveness. We cannot possibly offer anything in return. Even if you believe it's a wash as to whether or not it's just to forgive individuals, I'd argue you at the very least create more evil actions as a result of this incredibly punitive and incredibly like uh, antagonistic stance amongst these people. Three reasons. The first is that these individuals believe that they themselves become the victims because they have been punished. They have been canceled. They are people who are now victims of the greater social society because of shame or whatever else society has inflicted upon them and therefore are far more likely to believe that the actions and harmful things that they do are incredibly just as a result. But secondly, if they internalize that they cannot possibly change, a lot of the incentives to maybe change in the future or like shift behavior is unlikely to happen. So if the like actions they do that are harmful to others but benefit them have an incentive to be done, I'd argue then that these people have little to no capacity to do otherwise. But thirdly, I would say in the cases that people do bad things out of circumstance, you compound these circumstances even further, i.e. convicting individuals who you deem to be irredeem irredeemable are just far more likely to cause them to commit more crimes out of desperation if they cannot get work, if you have strong stigma against ex-convicts, etc. And therefore, they only do more harmful things upon other people. If you believe justice is a wash on both sides and you don't know who's winning, I would say the creation of more evil actions and the incentive to do so, because people internalize these narratives and believe that they are victims of a larger, more oppressive society are important. And note that incredibly average individuals are capable of doing great crimes as a result of these like factors and pushes. It is the belief of KKK individuals who are normally polite and respectful, but believe they have been victimized by greater American society and the invasion of minorities that leads them to be able to join these kinds of groups and justify their presence in this area as a result. What does that then bring to you? The first is simply that there is no proof as to whether or not, like, we can't just say forgiveness sometimes good, forgiveness sometimes bad. It's the calculation process that was incredibly assertively discussed in opening opposition. It is more rigorously broken down at closing government. But secondly, it is the like pragmatic implications of the actions that are taken on that I think are far more likely to cause evil action to be done in the future, and therefore ensure that the victims, the people who are innocent that will be the necessary recipients of these evil actions must ought to be protected as a result of the motion. I'm very proud to propose. Great. I thank that speaker for those remarks. And now to open up the back half of side opposition, I call upon the member of opposition. Here, here. Why the signing material left by opening government on their case doesn't make, still doesn't fall, falls in today's debate. Firstly, on CO. So they first say it's a good thing to have a narrative that has some people that are redeemable and some people that are not redeemable because then we become more objective in determining and protecting individuals. This is contingent on an accurate portrayal of what redeemable and irredeemable is, when Miko pointed out multiple structural reasons as to why it's unlikely to be accurate and why it's likely to privilege people who are from the elite and people who are not underprivileged under their side of the house. The first reason for this is because a lot of how we determine is conflated by the norms that exist within society. We pointed out that to a degree an action is repeated as a determinant of redeemability or irredeemability, a lot of people who repeat actions are those who do it because of circumstance and not because of the individual moral choice to do a particular action in the very first place and therefore you punish them more. But secondly, even if it's not just about the actions that they commit, a large chunk of what's the problem is how people perceive them relative to the actions that they have done. We explain to you that rich individuals have the privilege of being able to show that they do other good actions that exist within society, that they show their charity, that Brock Turner is able to show, oh, I'm also contributing as a good swimmer, etc. All of these things mean that people with power and people with the capacity or the privilege to nuance the, the descriptions of themselves and broadcast their own positive image are able to shape the way redeemability works and therefore people are unlikely to be successful. But thirdly, we would suggest that the definition of morality a lot of times excludes a lot of these poor individuals. And to a degree, a lot of gay people are considered to be irredeemable because of the constant instances of, of sin, because the, the, the vast majority of society perceives it to be such, you far further exclude them under their side of the house. They might say, they just assert and say that a ah, poor individual who still scram because of economic circumstance will not be perceived to be irredeemable. That's just a factual assertion compared to the structural levels of analysis we provide, and therefore we win the case. But secondly, I want to be very, very charitable to this argument. Even in their best case scenario, 
where because of our policy, we exclude some people from becoming part of the narrative. So there might be very chronically evil individuals who are privileged on their, their side of the house that are unlikely to be punished or not are likely to be seen as redeemable on their side of the house too. Why is that still okay? And why are we okay with that trade-off? The reason for it is a lot of the rich and privileged people, even if we perceive them to be irredeemable, have a lot of other mechanisms to protect themselves. Things like hiring very, very good lawyers to escape accountability, things like being able to bribe judges, which is terrible, but some people do so. And all of this means that even if we perceive them to be irredeemable, they're not able to get any ma ma like tangible change to their behavior. But that comes with a trade-off of potentially liberating a large swathe of the population who are currently seen as irredeemable, but are not able to at the point where we see everyone to be redeemable in the first place. The second claim then coming from closing opposition is, well, we create an incentive for people to positively change behavior because if you're below the threshold of redeemability, you want to stay there and continue to be irredeemable. Noticeably, in a world where everyone perceives people to be redeemable, then presumably there's still a positive incentive for you to be redeemable, which is because I know I'm currently wrong, I can potentially change and go from redeemability to being a good person or a good state. In fact, this is a better model and incentive for change because under their side, the people who fall on the other side, which is where they're already irredeemable, have no more any more incentive to change or believe that none of their actions can save them. And therefore, there's no incentive for them to be moral in the future. In fact, this explains why the argument coming from Miko about why we actually further push people to do even more harmful actions because we make them more angry, we deprive them of more resources, and we force them to become more radicalized under their side increases the number of instances of violence that exists under our side. And this is important because the opening exchange is generally about how people feel and are perceived later on. Insofar as we're able to reduce the number of instances of evil in the first place, we're the very least able to avert a harm as opposed to deaths that also able to just mitigate the harm by providing justice. And that's why the extension is very important. Before I move on, oh, oh. We said that people already recognize that many around them empirically don't deserve a second chance, but are told morally that they do. This implies that even if people are imperfect judges, they're still much more likely to leave bad relationships, which we told you outweighs your claims. Okay, so that, that'll boil down to my response to your case already, which is how we forgive individuals and whether or not it leads to more rational decisions. So the general case coming from all is that, first of all, people are pressured to forgive, and that's a problem because we want people to be forgiving evil individuals. So the first thing we point out in the POI is that it's not automatically redeemable, right? So people have to show some particular actions for them to change because it's not they're in a redeemable state, but not necessarily in a good state where you care about them already. In fact, recognizing that they are redeemable recognizes a start starting point of wrongness that they have to redeem. And therefore you recognize that they're evil in the first place, which is actually a good thing. But secondly, the opposite of their side is also problematic, right? Automatic cancel culture, where anytime one person makes a mistake, we take them out and exclude them from the rest of the society is problematic. One, because everyone does dodgy things. So presumably you're canceling off all the relationships that exist under their side. But secondly, because of the fact that people are like, sometimes are able to indeed change and make better themselves and protecting these relationships is a net utile outcome. Why is this important then? The deadlock of the debate is then broken about the default state of a person absent this narrative. Are they likely to be the irrational individuals that OO suggests, or are they likely to be irrational and are likely to default to cancel culture? Miko provided you the structural reasons as to why you're likely to default to cancel culture. Because it aligns with the biases of individuals to be angry, to be filled with emotion. Because it aligns with the short-term beliefs and the short-term perspectives versus growth, which requires you to foresee something in the future and not something in the default bias. Because it goes against the visceral, uh, the, the, the inherent need to make immediate causality and to make binary assumptions about people as opposed to seeing people in a more diverse and growth, growth uh, possible for growth. All this is important because absent this narrative then, people are likely to be leaded to the opposite direction and cancel people and lead to the equal harm. It is important therefore to have this narrative to counterbalance these individual feelings. The response coming from OO is, well, we can have a better narrative, which is to say some people are irredeemable and some people are not. The reasons why this is not sufficient to deal with this counter narrative is the first reason coming from Miko, where it is possible if you're angry, etc., to just sort people who you're angry at under the banner of people who are not redeemable already, and therefore you still never forgive them and automatically to cancel culture. But secondly, it's necessary to shift the overton window, right? To a degree, there a lot of people are currently inclined to cancel individuals. A softer stance will not make them reconsider a lot of their beliefs. It requires to make a hardline narrative. So even if they don't fully subscribe to the narrative, at least forces them to interrogate and reason about the current beliefs that they have right now and potentially change them. So at the end of this debate, we proved not only that we were better able to getting change and protecting those who are vulnerable, 
we prove that we're far more likely to make a rational calculation on forgiveness when we counter the inherent animalistic tendencies of man today. For all those reasons, then, we're very proud to propose. Thank you. Great. I thank that speaker for those remarks. And now to close out this debate as a whole, I call upon the opposition whip. Hear, hear. Hi, you're able to hear me okay? Yep, you're audible. Oh my, I've the same situation as XK. I have like a million papers in front of me, uh, which I normally don't do. I normally write in like tiny little writing on one piece of paper, which I've been trying less to do. So we've swung in the opposite direction. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to start by engaging CG on how I think this narrative operates when it is proliferated along with a large amount of bodies, because I think this moves beyond the upper house debate, where OO collapsed on a very narrow framings around abuse that the entire gov bench pointed out is due to a multiplicity of factors, other types of emotional and financial manipulation, other than the fact that we don't also decide whether or not we enter in an abusive relationship merely based on like what norms are present, and or as DPM pointed out, there are lots of competing norms present, and so it's not the delta or nor provides solvency in this unique narrow instance of cases, nor is it about what opening government talks about in terms of religion, for example, because I think that the PM never fails to res um, respond to my uh, my question where I genuinely asked in instances like Judeo-Christian frameworks where everyone is told that everyone is redeemable, why do we still see the type of vitriol that the PM themselves characterized for us? And that's because I think as OO and CG point out, OG provides little to no solvency about how this narrative operates, but especially in the hyper-polarized context like post-conflict states or like religious context that they talk about. And so it's actually think in the instances that they talked about where they see the least amount of solvency, even if they had provided next, because there are so many other strong counter incentives in terms of like literally existential, existentially believing that another religion is something that is a threat to you, threat to like your children's salvation, threat to like the lives of like other innocent souls, or in terms of like a post-conflict uh, setup. So I think that those are the instances, even if it had been mecked out, where to have the least amount of solvency. So then let's move where, um, let, then let's engage CG in terms of like broad, how this affects the majority of people. CG's first response to us is that ah the majority of marginalized bodies will never be seen as reading meeting the threshold of redeemability the problem is, is that the dpm rebutted this when the dpm engaged with the lo by saying that there are other modalities through which we mediate an understanding of redeemability such as the blackness of your body such as the queerness of your body which means that you are always going to mediate it through those things first and therefore since i don't think government solves for anti-racism or anti-queerness meaning that you are always going to condemn and morally not support and always have subconscious responses that villainize and vilify those types of bodies because of all of the other structural modalities of prejudice that government doesn't solve, meaning those harms are symmetric. Therefore, the debate should be arbitrated on other types of harms prevention that Ming Shuan brought you. What does that look like? Ming Shuan told you that in general, everyone should be a little bit more risk averse. We should be way more discerning in terms of the types of people that we allow and ascribe redeemability to. Ming Shuan told you that we should probably operate or we wish or that we supported operating on a gradient where you could fall on a spectrum of redeemability, where some people would be all the way at the end and therefore be unredeemable. OG says, ah, 
but we evaluate irredeemability on inaccuracies and irrationality. The problem is that they never looked in the mirror because we do all the same things they ascribe to irredeemability as we do to redeemability. Because then the whip spends half their whip talking about how the rich and powerful control the narratives and frameworks and resources that they have available to them to manipulate how we view them as redeemable or not redeemable, which means how we ascribe redeemability is equally irrational, if not more so, because the people operating or the people trying to prove themselves as redeemable are perversely incentivized to have us understand them as such. So not only are they at best for gov, symmetrically irrational, I also think that the, the whip then provides us the reasoning why we should probably trend towards irredeemability as our status quo default in a worst case for us that I'm literally going to show you why that still wins. Why? Because let's separate this into the two stakeholders we clash with CG with, regular people and the rich. The rich. Whip says, ah, small portion of cases. I say, yes, bite that bullet. Probably a small portion of cases, but it's a small portion of cases that's significant. Why? Because in the small portion of cases where we are more discerning, we believe these rich people to be more irredeemable. So we provide more social pressure, more protests, more like, uh, what's the word, boycotting of their goods that causes them to make moral changes. Even if it happens in a small amount of instances, that is good because the punishment that we are giving them is proportionate to the uh, overwhelming amount of harm that their privilege allows them to weaponize against us, which means that even if we're mitigating a very small portion of cases and getting more rich people to change their behavior by ascribing to them irredeemability until they prove themselves, even that marginal amount of change, one, avoids a large direct amount of harm in terms of the overwhelming capacity they have to hurt us through, for example, the corporations that they own. But secondarily, their indirect influence, because when the rich and powerful get away with things and we do not ascribe to them irredeemability, not only do they continue to directly harm people, they set an influence and they set a precedent that other people then follow. Other people think they can get away with it too. And it literally creates a social template for other types of abusers to then climb the ladder and operate under the same instances. So even if it's only a small percentage of change in the rich and powerful change, we think that that's still an overwhelming win for CEO. But the second is how it affects everyone else. And this is where Ming Shuan's casing about harms prevention is super important because we flip everything that the opposing government says about patterns of behavior. Because in general, I think that the average person ought to trend towards discernment and a prescription of irredeemability, even if it's a little bit inaccurate, even if it's a little bit irrational, as closing government has said, because that's where we prevent the most risk to ourselves. Why? Closing government characterized it for it nicely, because a lot of people have patterns of behavior that means that they're likely not redeemable. What does that mean? I think that it means that the all the modalities of power that we are inculcated into, like the patriarchy, like heteronormativity, like racism, like sexism, create patterns of behavior that are extraordinarily powerful, but they also create socializations and inculcations that are extraordinarily difficult to break, meaning that it's far rarer that individuals are able to break that control, which means that if you're hedging your bets or if you're making your best guess, it's probably better to ascribe irredeemability until proven otherwise, because that is where you are more likely to get yourself out of that situation, more likely to be critical, more likely to turn that criticism into political action and support for policies that are more critical, etc. What that means is that I think that individuals are able to provide themselves with more prevention of moral harm, but I also think that it means that individuals use and turn and weaponize that more criticism, that more ascription of irredeemability and towards more political change as well. These are much wider scale harms than what we got from OO. Why? One, it's just broader. It affects all individuals in literally all contexts insofar as us having better recognition or better preemption towards CG's patterns of behavior that end up hurting us. And so we are more likely to opt out of them. Secondarily, I think it's more consistent because I think that these modalities of prejudice are ever present and ever inculcated into literally every single person. And so it's a far more frequent thing that we're going to have to negotiate that we should be more discerning of. But then thirdly, I think that as we already showed, their case and collapsed onto an abuse mechanism that never proved the multiplicity of factors that show that. I think the last thing that I want to talk about is then how individuals feel about their irredeemability. This goes for both the GovWhip and the PMs sharing their individual story. I also have that story. The difference is that my pattern of behavior suggested that I was probably irredeemable. It was very unlikely that I went to New York and had a radical queer roommate and had radical queer politics, which means that it does make sense for the majority of people to ascribe to me a high level of irredeemability until proven otherwise. What that description to me did, though, is it created a drive within me to want to change. I did not want to be perceived as irredeemable. It made me want to do better. It made me want to change my behaviors because I saw that, one, the majority of people were saying it to me, and two, I saw that important people in society were changing it to me, which is why I changed. I'm not going to turn into a neo-Nazi because even if I accept that I'm irredeemable, like some individuals, like former gang members do, they still try and operate and do change afterwards even after they get out. So you can accept the level of irredeemability, but then still try and navigate social harms, navigate social benefits, and try and make up for it. I think we've shown you why we have the broadest casing. I also think we've flipped multiple portions of government casing. Proud to flow closing opposition. Thanks.
Great. I thank that speaker for that speech. I thank all speakers for what was a fine debate. I invite all speakers to virtually cross the floor and shake hands and then exit.